sorry, this is wrong side. That's not where we are. So I was going to talk about what what is called the 3D 1D approach, which was um, uh, actually those method never really worked very well, but it was published in Science, and it was like the first solution, uh, proposed solution to to the pro to the threading problem. So it was um, so from a historical perspective, it started off a lot of work, so it's interesting for that. Although the method itself really never was that good, actually. Uh, so the idea, of course, as I said, is that you have library of faults. You basically describe your structures, basically library structures, but you can classify them into faults. And uh, uh, you have a 3D profile. So you try to describe this library as a. This is a better model. So you have a structure here. You, you take each position in the structure, each residue, and classify it into structural environments. So you can tell if it's on the surface of a protein, or inside, or if it's in the helix, or in the sheet, or a bit of So actually you use mm, 18 categories, I think. So they divided the helix, strand, and coil. So there's three secondary structures. And then there are six groups of the side chain barrenness, basically how much is exposed to the um, to the outside and how much is it in contact with polar residues. So it's buried but in contact with other polar residues. And then you divide this into some discrete categories. So you have one, two, three, four, five, six, you have uh, buried, one, two, three, and the polar or partially buried, one, two, and exposed. Uh, and then you took this. So you can basically take your 3D structure and make a 1D model of it. And then you can take, so that was, so you have a structure here. And you can describe each position as, as one of these eight categories. So you can say that this is a helix in exposed 1. And you have a helix in exposed 2, and a helix in par partially buried 1, etc. So you can describe each category of these. And you can actually calculate what is the probability from a, how common is it to find an alanine in this group, or a valine, or, is it, or a uh, tryptophan. So you basically have a log gods score, exactly as you do when you do a substitution matrix. So you can make a profile like this. Here. So you have here, you have, in this case, you turn it around. So Buried alpha, and then you get a score here. So in this position, it's good to have an alanine and bad to have an alanine. They multiply by 100, etc. 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 So you have a what they call a profile here. So it's basically very, very, exactly the same format as a profile from a sequence profile. Same thing. But it's just not calculated for sequences, it's calculated for structures. And then, of course, you can take a sequence. And do it using standard dynamic programming alignment to get, this, get alignment of this one. And then in this paper, actually, what it did was not to make it for fold recognition of thread or, or to recognize fold. It said, it said what sequences matches this fold, this structure. So you use a sequence way to search. Yes. So what you end up with in the matrix is sort of the the the, the normalized frequencies for. for like all phenylalanines, and then you see that for phenylalanines, they're this likely to be found at the end of the helix, pointing outward. Something exactly. Like that. In principle, they don't have much detail, but yeah, but it, and or, or well, I think it's formulated the other way around. For what is the probability to find a phenylalanine in this position? Yeah, it, it's the uh, normalization is slightly different, but it's yeah. the same idea. I mean, probably a lot. I mean, it depends on how many, how you know, how, how frequent phenylalanine it is by itself. Yeah. So that, uh, but basically, the, you, and the, you have to calculate, you have to calculate, count, my time to find it. There is a, the reason, there's a couple of tweaks why it actually sort of works, but that's one, but that's, the, they actually used a lot of substitutions into the, in the data, in the end of the data. They didn't have enough, enough structures, so when they had these categories here, they counted here, 
they also took all the homologous sequences. And by that, of course, they got, they got some kind of substitution matrix into it. So it's sort of, it has substitution information in it also. They don't say that in the paper, but if you look at it later, you realize that. I don't, well, I know that you realize that. But anyway, this, this, the whole idea is basically, it's, uh, from this step on, it's just standard sequence proof alignment. That, that's why I call it 3D profile. Uh, and uh, the good thing is that you basically use dynamic programming. It's exactly st standard alignment. In principle, I guess you could do blasting or also. I don't know why that's ever done that, but I guess you could. Uh, yeah, and the, the thing is that the trick that actually worked is, in principle, actually, you don't want, if you want to do full recognition, you don't really want the probability to find a certain amino acid in a position. What you want to find is like how likely is it to be found to be aligned in the position, like how is it basically the substitution, which of course could be the same, but it's actually not really all the same, same the way they formulate the problem, but it, it's similar, so, and they actually use the later one. But that's uh, something that was not mentioned in the paper, you have to realize when you work on it yourself. So in, in, at the same time, or one year later, there was another paper published by uh, guy called David Jones and Janet Thornton and, and I guess Billy was there also, Billy Taylor. <laughs> so perhaps in Nature instead. And there was the same, I mean, the same ideas were coming by a lot of other people, particularly one guy called Ma Manfred Sippel, but also by Stephen Bryant and others, a lot of people that are there. So the idea is basically hey, is that you have pair potential. So you calculate what is the probability that two amino acids are in contact. Uh, so here you have two, some energy. So you basically take you, you say you take your database of structures and you calculate how often do I find an alanine and tryptophan twelve ohms away from each other. Or in this case, and then, then, then you turn, take the log of that, basically, and you turn it into a potential. So in this type, I don't know what I mean, as there are, you see that this likes to be six times far away from each other, and basically they're too far away, you have zero, so it doesn't, it doesn't matter. But they not, don't like to be too close, because they're going to overlap. You have to do a lot of normalization for me, for example, a few points and stuff, so this is a bit not, not trivial, and ideally, of course, you want to have small functions, and that, but in principle, you can do it. And then, on the other hand, this two amino acids likes to be seven angstroms, eight angstroms away from each other, and not so close. So the, the, the thing behaves a bit different. And uh, you also have to. One thing that's is obviously it's obvious, it matters how far away two residues are in the sequence from each other. If you have residues that are next to each other, they're always going to be. In, 2.8 ohms away from each other, at least in the alphas. So, so how many residues that are in between is different things. So this is like a kind of look interaction. So like these two will have three residues in between, they're very likely to be in contact. On the other hand, these two that are far away from each other have another score. So this has to be affected in another way. Of course, it's something that has to be found in here is like to be in contact if there are three, three or four residues away from each other. From what point in the amino acid is it this just calculated? Is from like the side chains? Often, uh, I mean, people use different things. Often, C beta is a common thing. I mean, people can use C alpha. The good thing with C beta is you have more direction in the right direction. The problem, I mean, you can also use the closest residue and the side chains. The problem is, uh, all these cases, you know, side chain size matters. So if you use the beta for the big side chain, means you put you further away. But uh, if you now if you close atom between any position in the side chains, they are um, that Mesibit is often a good compromise. But people try different things. Exactly what David Jones used there. I will guess you see Alpha Mesibita. I can't really remember. But I mean, it, 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 the idea is the same. Just, but so Mesibit is often normal thing you do. So the only difference is you'll get different profiles. So I guess yeah, you get different numbers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They'll be shifted in a minute. I mean, in principle, the interaction should be atoms, so basically we have all side chains, but sometimes the side chains are not as well built, I think that's the point difference. It, 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 it probably is not a big difference. There's one problem here. Do you remember what was the rules for dynamic programming? So, uh, if you want to use the dynamic programming as you want to use here, what was the requirement when we calculated the score of one position here? 
that it, it is only dependent on the previous score. Exactly. It only depends on the previous score. But if the score of this one and your contact with this one over here matters, so your force, this one will depend on what is lying over there. <coughs> so that means that you cannot use the dynamic program straight off. So there are, there, are, there are a few tricks. There's something called double dynamic program. It's basically you do two, two runs of this one. It gets quite slow, but you can do it. I don't think it guarantees the optimal solution, but it, it gets one solution. Another option is that you basically ignore and say, whatever is over here, when I can this for here, is not what I have in my sequence myself, but I have it in, in the target sequence. Then you can iterate a few times. And, or you can go without the gap, then it's not a problem for us, but that's easy, but that doesn't really make sense. So there have been some tricks, but basically that, that's one of the, where you can do some kind of monster callers to actually try to move things around for a thing that. But these are, doesn't really, all right. In practice, it, it makes it much slower. So you don't want to use this method for searching a sequence database, but for a structured database, it sort of worked at least even a long time ago. So that, that is, this particularly this threading with sequence methods worked quite well. So this should quite, was quite useful in, in CAST for many years. It's sort of, I mean, until you have big sequence databases, until Cyblas and things that turn off, it was really the, the best methods. But it was somehow in the hand of some experts. They were really doing manual. They had. They knew what they were doing. It was not really like automatic things. You have to run it and get the an answer. Another method that actually worked quite well. That was introduced a few years later. It was a very much simpler method. It's basically. I think I mentioned something similar the other day. Is that you can also use secondary structure predictions. So basically, you do stand, you, you predict, you have your, you have your secondary structure of your, of your fold, of your proton, and you do a secondary structure prediction of your query your proton, just like we did last week, and then you basically say, if I predict it to be a sheet and it is a sheet, I give it a little bit better score. You can even do it for two, you can even have a predictive structure on both sides, and probably helps a bit. But for the better predictions, the better things we get. And it's very simple. It's just you don't break into the program. It's basically says here I have the score of the alignment of a uh, function of a aligned to b plus some other function of uh, the secondary structure, position a, alignment, second structure, and b. It can be very simple. It can be zero when they disagree, and one if they agree, or something like that. You can play around with it. Uh, there have also been people playing around with, so this actually seemed to work quite well. So there was a method called, uh, so this is, if we're gonna say, well, this is if you use secrets alone. If you just use a secret structure with nothing else, you actually get in this, this benchmark, this is the, how many correct hits you find in the, for each force positive ones you find. So like this is kind of rock curve in the one, one one of it. So you basically jump from here to here, and uh, and then so you can jump. In, in this case, actually, structure alone is better than using secrets. So you just use second structure. I think there's a bit of bias there because that's what it should normally work like that. I think, but if you combine it, you do better. And then you use two different tables in this case, substitution matrices in this case. But you see here, they actually only it's only. Seeker substitution, so they, they, they didn't compare the band plus side loss because side loss was not really that used in those days. And uh, there was also another type of methods that was a bit similar to what we talked about last Thursday, so an evaluation of methods at the end. And the one that sort of worked was, was something called gene threader. So basically, it does a seeker's alignment, as always, but no. And then we make a model, and then from this model, so instead of trying to thread this this, this uh, potential through the model, they actually just take the alignment, the sequence alignment, and then they calculate the potential. So they don't have to optimize it, and they uh, have this, as, and then they have this as input to a neural network. So they have and uh, some other features. So they have no standard class classical network between layers, and the input is the 
alignment score, alignment length, the length of the sacred heart, and this, this energy. Uh, so, for instance, if you have uh, a good alignment, so a good Paris energy score, you can get. Uh, and so this is different sequence scores, and then, so if the sequence score is high, you can have a bad alignment because you go to high score output. But if the sequence score is immediate, you you gain if your energy is better. So you, you, you see how much is wasted in the scores together. But you can see that the sequence score is, this goes it jumps up a lot. You can't get a high score if you don't have 120 in sequence score in this case. Whatever that means. So people tried many, many different things, but on, at the end, of course, we we have so many more sequences, and we have, and uh, particularly cyborgs worked very well in the mid '90s. So we have one sequence in the profile, but then actually what we realized is that we should do is to take profile against profiles. So we want to take two profiles and compare each other. This is what. Or we can take two hidden marker models and compare to each other. This is the same. The idea is the same. So basically, you want to calculate what if you have here an ALV and here here GS. What are the scores of aligning this profile to these profiles? And you can do that in different. There are different scoring methods and different things you can do it with different ways. But it doesn't break any sequence, um, any dynamic programming things. It's actually you can, of course you can add structure information to it if you want to, but you don't need to really. So basically, taking comparison of this vector to this vector here of, of, of free frequencies, and you can use, as I said, people try many different ways to compare these vectors. You can use dot product <laughs> correlation coefficient or something like that. But you can do at the end just a standard dynamic programming, and you can do it quite well. So we did some work on this some years ago, and you can get quite good. Performance. This uh, yes, yes. One is Kazarian test sets. Another one is the number of rock curves. So this is the number of uh, rate of false positives. So it's between hundreds, everything's wrong to nothing's wrong over here somewhere. And then we have divided the data set into three categories. So like the family are the ones that are in the same scope families. So they're similar. Super family are the same super family, but different families. And fold are the same folds, different folds. So you see the folds, the ones that we that are not the same superfamilies. So the the scope says that these are not homologous. They also have the same structure. You see that we're really, really bad at them. We can find some of them, but it's really bad. The some ones are in the same family, we find 80% of them. And even size loss, which is the bottom line here, the green one, find 70% of them, maybe can jump a bit. But in this category of things that are in the same superfamily, but different families, we can jump from maybe 10% correct, that's 1% error rate, 10% error rate, to maybe 20%, 25% even. So you can find twice as many. And uh, yeah, people have done. I don't. I don't get the same slide there. Right. So. Uh, so people have done the same thing with hidden marker models. It's exactly the same type of things. You want to take one hidden marker model and hidden marker model two, and you want to match them together. So. How similar this match takes to the other, and you can actually have a, a, a hidden mark model of this that looks like that. So, what you're comparing is the coefficients of the two hidden mark models. Yeah, but it's, yeah, so this is the emission probabilities here, are the same as this one's over here. Which is basically three because we have mean asterisk in that position. Mm -hmm. And that, that exactly how you do this comparison, people do different things, and they, I don't really know what is the best way to do today, but you want, you want to take it the same type of information as you do. Uh, when you when you use uh, different, uh, uh, I mean, you use substitution matrices. You want to see if the center of the mass should be the same. Or if it's conserved in both, it should be conserved in both. But you can take um, well, the dot product is not the best way to do. But you can, you, even that is quite easy. Yes. This is. But if you are querying just a single sequence, so I give you a sequence, and uh, the question you're asking is what is the uh, structure of this sequence? Yeah. So you get this profile by... So what you do is, you you first you do a search of, of the sequence database, mm -hmm. and then you get the profile, and then you have a library of profiles for your structures, and you compare these to each other. And that is 
There are still people who structure, but in general, these methods are more powerful today. Yeah. But what are the, the other profiles? So the reference profiles. Yes, yeah, so you made for every the every, every structure in PDB. So every every known proto structure. Really? <laughs> yeah, it's over hundred thousand. Yeah. Okay. So, but often you even have divided into domains. So you even have every, every domain, so you have three hundred thousand. Right. You, Half of them are identical to something else, half of them are going to throw away. Or make sure, or, or, so maybe half a half dozen domains in the, the database for that. It's not that much. I mean, still, the profile, profile comparison was much slower than the comparison secrets profile because you need to multiply these two numbers together. So it, it's, it's still the only, still, this is the best. And you probably can use some similar trick as, as you do in Blast. You can speed up a lot of things are unnecessary if you do that correctly. But then, in principle, you have to design this hidden mark or networks mm -hmm. the same, so because otherwise they're not. Sure. Problem. I mean, you should use. There are lots of overlap laws, and yeah, you need to do tests to figure out how it works. So they're, they're obviously, but it's, in principle, it's not nothing difficult, nothing theoretically difficult. So this is nowadays what people do, but still, as I said, there's many different methods to do this. So there actually are, and so still this CASP competition con continues, and there's still benchmarks, and there's still a number of groups that are almost equally well. And uh, partly it's just engineering. It's like if you miss two targets, you're, you're lost because you somehow... I mean, you had a bug in your network or in program somewhere, or you didn't have a server response. But it, to really do very well in something is something a bit difficult. But, and also sometimes, but for a long time, it was... I can jump to that slide first. So at least 10 years ago, or 15 years ago, it was quite clear that there was a group of manual experts that were much better than the uh, uh, than the best computer programs. So clearly, it was like I mean, so there was this cash competition. Every year, people, we start, started testing servers. You had a server, you put, put you run it. And of course, there, these methods were developed by the same people that had made a program. They were they were experts. And. Uh, but it was clear that the many experts, of course, use computer also, were, did much better prediction. Let me ask, answer my daughter. So, so it was clear that uh, the manual methods were, uh, many experts were better. So one thing that was obvious was that actually these people that were really good at this, which was not me, but other people, were really using many different methods that they tried to play around with and see whatever was consistent. So one thing we and others realized was that a prediction is really good when you have different methods saying the same thing. So if you take the five best methods in the, wor in the world and they all give the same answers, in this case there are five different methods, so fire and one to three, and so the methods are all good, and they basically give identical models, then you're very unlikely to be wrong. We, we don't know which model is better, if this model is better than that one, but it's very likely that in one of these models is among the best ones. So, this was another example. So if you did that, you, you could basically divide all the targets into three categories. You could say that our... Uh, so we did, first we did this manually. So we had, we had a trivial, easy and hard ones. So basically, trivial ones were basically many methods had very significant scores and they gave the same answers, so it was obvious what was that. 
I mean, the hard ones were basically everything disagreed. But there was a middle ground here that actually most reserves, but not all of them, gave the same result. So it was a clear majority vote. And of course, it's very unlikely that you have half of the matter saying the same thing and the rest say something else, and this half is wrong. So, uh, and we noticed then in CASP 4 that this method is clearly better than each of the individual methods by himself. Because of course, this some, these individual methods, at least in those days, sometimes make mistakes. They don't have the database of the wrong sc scores or damage. Like, if you put them together, actually, they're better than the best one, which is not always the case. So we did, then we developed basically computational methods that did the same thing. And the idea is here is basically you have, well, you collect all the predictions, you record the scores, and you have the, you calculate the number of neighbors. So basically, you look at how similar is this model to all other models they generate doing a structural alignment. And in those days, we put this into a neural network. Nowadays, we skip all this. We just, we just take the average of this number here. And it's, it's, it's a good measure of the quality of the model. So we just, we just ask, how good is this model? It's even so good so you can tell you what part of the model is correct and what part of the model is bad. So basically, we have some benchmarks of this, of course, to be somehow this was the, this is also another type of test. We had, this was BLAST, we have nothing with BLAST. This was the, the individual methods here. They were more or less equally good. They find 50 to this, whatever, 100 proteins had. This method was slightly worse, another one was slightly better. But in general, it was not hard to say which one was best. But if you combine them together, we can jump up there. So this, so this is so basically this just shows that if you, it's, if you combine many methods together, you, you can sometimes get a better result. Uh, so then you can also. So this, this, this was some years ago, and it's a, a few years ago in 2012. There was like 10 CAST meetings. We had an anniversary when this Nick Christian, this Eco database, tried to summarize what has been the most important progress in CASP during 20 years. First, okay, yeah, he said a computer self structure picture. And basically, the first cast back pictures have been paper models. That was not a good idea. They were hard to evaluate. So, computers, are, if you have computers, you help. It was quite clear that this kind of potential, this probability to find terrestrial contacts, are much more useful than having something that really discovered physics. So, physics can calculate the electrostatics, so find the walls interaction, and that these potentials are quite useless for this, for this problem. And one reason is because they ignore entropy. You really do not have entropy, in so you really do not describe entropy in the correct way. You can try to add it, but it's not as trivial. Uh, so this kind of statistical potential that you may use was basically looking at other structures, see if t t the context and types of things look similar to each other. This is what I'll talk about tomorrow, partly. This is with local threading and fragments. And so basically, we find even for difficult problems, you can take small fragments and put them together and make good models. This is particularly David Baker that, that has developed these methods, but well, he was one of the introducers of it. This kind of averaging consensus methods work that we kind of did, did, did start doing. We have been better and better at making quality assessments, as I talked about in the last third. We have this trophy method, and other people also done it. Uh, they have improved this model. It's also obvious that sequence profiles are more powerful than threading. So really, using sequence information is actually better. So if you want to find remote quality, sequence is better than structure. And those is particularly scolding and shang has developed putting bad templates together. So you can really find templates there and put combine them together, you can get better models. And last time, uh, in last CASP 11, CASP 12 now, it's very, very clear that this contact predictions has worked. There was contact predictions completely disappeared because people did that 20 years ago, but it didn't work. And then in the last few years, it started working again. And I will talk about it tomorrow. And contact predictions just that you do a prediction saying that rescue 5 and 25 are in contact. And it was a fundamental change a few years ago. Okay, so that's it. Uh, there are no questions. <laughs>